Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Dirks, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Making Human Anatomy Interactive in and Out of the Classroom, which is sponsored by Gail Sengage. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60-minute live presentations provide the opportunity for interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. Before we get started, I'd like to point out a few features of the webinar software. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. Along the right-hand side, you will see a chat and Q&A panel. Please use the Q&A panel to ask questions throughout the presentation, um, and you can use the chat panel to submit technical questions directly to me, the host. At the end of the presentation, we'll take some time to answer your questions, so please feel free to submit them throughout. If you lose audio or would like to change how you are connected to it, look under the uh, chat box on the right-hand side of your screen and click on the phone question mark icon. Please also note that we are recording today's program, and all registrants will receive follow-up instructions on how to access the archived version. And now, I'm very pleased to turn the floor over to Laura, who will be introducing our speakers for today. Hello everyone, uh, I am Laura Messing, Marketing Manager for Gale, with a focus on academic libraries. I'd like to welcome you today to our webinar and thank you for attending. We hope that you find the content presented today educational and informative. I'd now like to introduce our speakers for today's webinar. Dr. Darren Hoffman is an assistant professor and is vice chair of educational programs at the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine. He has been faculty at the University of Iowa for 11 years, teaching gross anatomy in multiple health professions programs in lecture and laboratory settings. He conducts research on self-regulated learning and outside of the class learning experience for professional students. And as a consultant for Vived, he helped to develop a fully dissectable 3D virtual model of the human body for anatomy courses. He recently developed a series of interactive gross anatomy learning modules called Gale Interactive Human Anatomy, launched in 2016. And I'd also like to introduce Jerry Sawchuk, the, direct, the senior director Business Science Analytics for the Academic Market at Gale, a Cengage company. He has been in product management for over 35 years, with the last 12 years in the educational publishing industry, having spent nine years with Gale, in which he's developed over a dozen new products, and three years with ProQuest, where he was a publisher of natural science products. Thank you again to our presenters today, and now I'd like to hand it over to Jerry. Jerry, please take it away. Thank you, Laura, and thanks to all of you attending today and taking valuable time from your schedules to learn about our new product, Gale Interactive Human Anatomy. I'd like to start here. Uh, I think in pictures you teach in words. We came across this statement in our research on doing spatial versus auditory learning. Research that we were doing here at Gale to improve our products by understanding the learning process better. Of course, it's a continual process as the technology involves and new generation of learners emerge. The statement was actually a title of an article, I think in pictures you teach in words, The Gifted Visual Spatial Learner by author Leslie Sword. And Leslie is the Director of Gifted and Creative Services in Australia consultant who specializes in the psychology of the gifted and who has worked with gifted people of all ages for over 15 years. And that's where I'd like to begin by talking a little bit about how Gale came to create the product platform, Gale Interactive, and the first academic product in the series, Human Anatomy, which we'll be talking about today. We also have another Gale Interactive product that we launched back in April on multiple subjects called Gale Interactive Science, and another one that we'll be releasing later this year covering chemistry. During our initial research, we came upon some very curious questions, and one of them was, are certain subjects better suited to visual spatial learning? 
But before we answer that, let's spend a brief moment on left brain, right brain ways of thinking. Uh, left brain or auditory sequential learners are students that are verbal and analytical and tend to be step-by-step -step learners versus the right brain or visual spatial learners who are students who are whole part learners. And this would be a student that says, give me the whole picture and I'll figure out how it all goes together myself. Of course, there's a long list of traits in which these two classes of learners are different and unique in their own way. But let's return to the original question of, are certain subjects better suited to visual spatial learning? And the answer that researchers found was, yes, indeed, there is a, a difference. And auditory sequential learners actually do better at algebra and chemistry, whereby visual spatial learners tend to excel in geometry and physics. So the brain has two ways of perceiving reality, and there's been a considerable number of studies that have researched this. And let's take a brief look at a few of these now. Unless the right hemisphere is activated and engaged, attention is low and learning is poor. This is a direct quote by Jerry Levy, uh, Dr. Jerry Levy, an American psychologist who's done tremendous research on the brain, currently out of the University of Chicago. Dr. Levy did some extensive work in analyzing the brain in this area, but a significant point of her work was that both hemispheres of the brain work together rather than separately. And there really is not an on-off switch that makes any one of us one way or the other. There's variations to this, and depending upon how strong you have in one side or the other varies by individual learner. Hence, Gale realized that through this research, we could create a product that expands the traditional auditory sequential learning mode of most research and learning products, and to achieve this by adding 3D interactive models for the visual spatial learners in certain subjects, and one of those subjects, of course, is human anatomy, as we're talking about today. With the brain perceiving reality in two different ways, then how does a different or expanded learning methodology impact student retention and understanding? And of course, technology has a significant impact on the learning methodology we're using here. Now, here's a direct quote from Dr. Hoffman, our guest speaker today, who says, this technology really comes in handy for challenging areas to teach. For example, the pelvis, nerves of the pelvis, these areas are hard to understand. Another example is the human skull, and one really needs to see the depth, which can only be seen via 3D. But as that, Dr. Hoffman will be discussing his own research and showing some of his own preliminary research results here, we'll defer to his talk in a few minutes, further explanation and demonstration. This study was done from 2008 to 2012 by a grant from the National Science Foundation which was titled The Effects of Computer-Assisted Instruction in Teaching Human Anatomy, an Experimental Study. It was done in conjunction with researchers at Augustana College in Rock Island, Illinois, and St. Ambrose University in Davenport, Iowa, using the technology in Gale Interactive Human Anatomy by our technology partner, CyberScience 3D. In the product, this technology is branded by its product name, powered by VivEd. The study involved over 700 students at both universities and utilized a control group and a CAI group or a computer-aided instruction group to measure the differences. And their results were computer-assisted instruction increased students' ability to interpret 3D relationships and retain essential course material in undergraduate anatomy and anatomy and physiology courses. A more recent study was done by Professor Brian Stout of Northwest Vista College in San Antonio, Texas, this year, in fact, in partnership with McGraw-Hill Education. They also used a control group in their study, and what they found was, as a result of using spatial learning grades on Professor Stout's first exam, a measure of student understanding of the course material in the first four chapters of the textbook, were 11 points higher than without this technology. And over the entire semester, he concluded that the average increase among all exams was slightly over 4%. 
Let's now turn to the product, Gale Interactive Human Anatomy, and I'll briefly cover the major features before Dr. Hoffman does a live demonstration of the product. And let's also begin this discussion with a statement about technology and briefly review the minimum system requirements that I've shown here. Because our platform uses some very advanced graphics, it's important that the hardware you use and the connection that students have to the library are robust. The newer and higher end your computer is, the better your experience will be. However, I want to point out that Gale Interactive Human Anatomy will also provide a choice for users. With a high bandwidth connection to the internet, a student or library may elect to use the WebGL version in which the product requires no plugins or downloads, but access everything through the web. Or a student or library may elect to use our desktop viewer version, which is accessible from within the product that allows the particular device the user is accessing to download the models and store them on the device, largely like an Acrobat reader or something of that sort, thereby eliminating model load times in the future and after it is downloaded. Note, however, that the desktop viewer version is initially only available from a Windows-based machine. And I might add that the desktop viewer is going to be released next week for those of you already trialing the product and don't see it there as of yet. Let's move from product technology to product objectives and the actual content that's there. Our primary objective in the product as a result of the research, some of which I've shared today, was to provide a solution for both auditory sequential learners who are step-by-step -step learners and therefore would appreciate a session-based organized learning path, and visual spatial learners who just want to dive into the whole picture and explore it on their own. So our objective here with the interactive platform was to accommodate both types of learners. The product contains over 4,300 structures and 13,500 identifiable landmarks of the human body with a session-based learning model organized by either the system, as you see down here on the left, such as skeletal, muscular, circulatory. It's actually organized into eight major systems. Or the region, which is like head and neck, lower limb, uh, organized into six regions. So the entire human body is covered within the product. Also included on the right-hand side you can see here are over 60 three-dimensional STL print files to utilize your 3D printers at your institution, in which the product library of these will be growing throughout the product's life cycle. So we have 60 now and we'll continue to add more as we evolve. As the student opens any session, there will be a viewer screen on the left, as you can see from here. And that's the 3D interactive, in, uh, wait a minute, let me get, I'm sorry, here we go. That's the 3D portion of it. For the visual spatial learner who just wants to dive in or use in the classroom by the teaching professional, they can click on this box on the lower left and the screen will open up and they can simply interact with the models at their own pace. At any time in any of the sessions, this is allowed. So once within a learning session, it doesn't necessarily have to be followed and the model can be dived into at any given time. For the auditory learner, there are 125 learning sessions which are progressive by advancing the lesson by clicking on the advanced arrows on the left and the right hand side of the viewing window where a user will be progressed through the learning session. There's also a multi, uh, this is also viewable from the bottom, it may be difficult to see it from here but there are dots at the very bottom of the screen which allow a user to actually see where they are particularly in a session. There's also multi-question quizzes at the end of each session which Darren, Dr. Hoffman will show you. There's also labeling of individual anatomical parts as a user hovers over an item if it's not already visible in the lesson. And of course, the interactive capability to magnify, rotate, or peel away layers of the model. The interactive technology is coupled with authoritative reference content in several different ways. 
The sessions include reference content, as you can see from the right-hand side, and as the lesson progresses, the content will change. The user can also use the more traditional method by doing actual searches within the product for up-to-date periodical library and additional reference material that's contained within the actual product itself. The last way is that the session content is interlinked to your library science subjects in your GVRL collection. So in fact, a student can hyperlink to another web page, open up GVRL, and explore your electronic reference collection for additional material. Note that the only content serviced in GVRL is the relevant content that is indexed by subject, thereby eliminating any non-related material that would surface in traditional Google searches. For example, a love story, say, when searching on heart. So all the actual uh, key content is returned. An important point to note here is that this allows the library to also custom build a content list to accompany the Gale Interactive Platform by adding pertinent titles to your electronic reference collection. To conclude my introduction, this slide represents the next questions that may be on all of your minds, all questions that address learning outcomes for students who have Gale Interactive Human Anatomy in their library, and areas that Dr. Hoffman will touch on next in his talk. Visual aids, are they key to, keep to students' understanding? Can Gale Interactive Human Anatomy act as a supplement and in even some cases even a substitute for lab resources? Where labs do exist in the curricula, will Gale Interactive Human Anatomy prep the students for lab dissection? And finally, the whole aspect of active learning. Will it help students come to class prepared and know the overall concepts before a lecture starts? We here at Gale believe it does all of these things and we hope that you do as well. So now I'd like to turn the presentation over to Dr. Darren Hoffman, who has used this technology in his classrooms in the past and is currently using Gale Interactive Human Anatomy in the current fall semester at the University of Iowa in Iowa City. Dr. Hoffman? Thanks, Jerry, uh, and thanks everybody for um, attending today. I hope you find that this is um, worth your time. Um, this exposure to this new technology. Um, what I want to do with my part of the presentation is um, to show you uh, how the program works um, and how this might work for an instructor versus a student who's studying at home on their own, um, and then take you through um, some of the lessons that I've learned in trying to integrate this type of technology into my classes and then also working with my colleagues on those issues, and then um, end with some data um, um, from classroom studies where we addressed specific uh, curriculum problems using this technology. Um, but first, I'd like to start um, by just um, providing a little bit of context for um, where growth anatomy is as, a, um, as an educational enterprise. Um, when most people think about growth anatomy, they think about a picture like this. Um, this is, an, of course, a, a Rembrandt painting from a very long time ago. Um, and, you know, up to, you know, this is a, a photo from the University of Iowa in 1900, where it basically looks the same, um, same process of taking the body apart. And this is, a, you know, a 21st century anatomy lab um, that looks, again, very much the same. The faces in the class may be changing, but the process is really similar. Um, and this, this is because this is such a, such a great engaging experience. That, um, that really works for people who think with their hands and for people who think with their eyes, um, people who communicate um, to articulate their learning. Um, it, it's one of those great learning experiences that, um, frankly, I feel like makes my job kind of easy sometimes um, because I have this as a central learning experience. Um, but I don't want to give you the impression that um, gross anatomy teaching is, you know, at the level of the 1600s. So I do want to do some diligence and. Uh, make sure to point out that, you know, there is a lot of technology in modern anatomy classrooms that, you know, most institutions, I think, now utilize things like lecture recordings and broadcasts. We certainly do at the University of Iowa. Um, lots of um, physical and virtual clinical simulations allow us to um, do brand new things in the classroom, as well as incorporation of clinical data um, and actual patient images um, as part of our classes. Um, and then in the anatomy laboratory, um, there are a lot of new options available um, to either supplement 
or replace for the um, dissection experience. Um, you can see on the left um, the anatomage table is essentially like a giant iPad type device um, where there's a which stores a virtual cadaver that can be rotated, turned, um, um, which works very well for um, some situations where a cadaver is not really available or not an option. Another physical um, example is the uh, what you see on the bottom. Um, these are called thindavers. These are synthetic cadavers uh, made from plastic and rubber um, that that simulate a lot of the anatomical relationships of the human body and allow students to explore them when an actual cadaver isn't an option. Um, and then lastly, you see on the right um, a picture of a student working with a virtual um, cadaver um, at the table side. Um, as part of the dissection process, they're using these resources uh, to supplement their dissection work. Um, so it's certainly an enriched environment, but um, there are some major teaching and learning challenges that we've experienced in anatomy over the years. Um, within the lab, um, some dissections are just better than others. Um, there's some parts of the body that are hard to dissect, um, especially for first-time learners. Um, so in those situations, it's nice to have supplements available um, to make the learning outcomes a little bit more uniform. Um, also, we take for granted in the United States that dissection is the norm in medical education. Um, but if you look worldwide, that's actually not the case at all. Um, there are many different religious or cultural practices, for example, um, in Muslim countries or in areas um, where people practice Orthodox, Orthodox Judaism. Um, dissection is not even an option uh, because of ways of handling bodies after death. Um, so um, in those situations, these, these additional resources are incredibly important um, to make sure that students have good anatomy experiences. Um, furthermore, as a lecturer, um, you know, the, the anatomy of the human body is certainly not two-dimensional, and it can be very difficult to um, explain the three-dimensional relationships of the body, say, in a picture like you see here, um, where we're looking at the pelvic floor. Um, almost every surface here is round. So it's very difficult for a student to be able to understand um, the contours and shapes of these structures without being able to see that object move to infer some of those um, different relationship. Um, and then lastly, you know, I personally believe that the majority of learning um, in medical school or dental school um, actually happens at home when students working on their own um, to make it stick. And the effectiveness of this process for students is incredibly variable as they start um, their professional training program. In most programs, anatomy is one of the first classes they take, so this is one of the courses that um, shows them that they need to learn how to learn. And um, so what I've experienced is that typically students resort to the memorization strategies that got them into medical school, um, and they find that they don't work for processing complex three-dimensional relationships um, because there, frankly, are just too many structures in the body to rely exclusively on memorization. So I'm going to switch over to um, – I'm going to share my screen with you guys so you can see um, the – anatomy program in action here, and we're just going to take a look at the um, at a session about the blood and nerve supply to the scalp. Um, again, this is sort of the, the main screen as you enter it, but you can expand this out. Um, as a presenter, I probably want to work with it this way, and I could also minimize the um, prescribed text that goes with it if I wanted to, you know, direct the student's attention to something different. Um, in this session, we're just going to go through um, the different nerves and arteries that supply the scalp region. It's actually a very diverse region that has a lot of different structures that um, all come from different places. You can see there's nerves that come from the front, from the sides, and the back that all converge on this area. Um, so as Jerry was saying, throughout the session, the student has complete control of, um, of what they're working on. They can mouse over objects if they're curious about the names of them, um, and the names will pop up. They can pull structures off if they're curious about what's behind. Um, if, for example, they're interested in more about following the path of this auricular temporal nerve, they could rotate the object or, and um, follow it through to find out where it came from. So that really works well for students who need to learn um, through exploration. Um, this, this is just showing you a few different examples of the different nerves um, that are involved um, at each slide, you're seeing different um, sort of um, narrated texts. Um, I wrote these with the intention that they would 
take no longer than 10 minutes for the average student to work through, kind of making um, best use of our students' attention um, and focusing on the key objectives that are common to most professional anatomy courses. Um, and then we switch over to the arteries on this side. Um, and this, here we're looking at arteries that are passing through the orbit um, to come onto the face. Um, and then here we're looking at some arteries um, that are coming from the side of the head and then sort of branching out onto the side of the scalp. Um, then uh, each session ends with a series of four or five quiz questions that just sort of reiterate the most important concepts of that session and give students a chance to test themselves and figure out if they are on the right track. Um, th this particular type of question is a multiple choice question that just asks which nerve supplies the scalp with sensory innervation, the anterior scalp. Uh, if you choose the wrong answer, um, it flashes red and you don't get to move on, but if you choose the correct answer, it flashes green and you move on to the next question. Um, this, is a, this question asks the student to actually find an object and click on it um, in order to um, to move on to the next question. This is asking for the artery that supplies the area of the lateral scalp posterior to the ear, which would be the posterior auricular artery. Click on that one and we move on. Um, this type of question involves um, a label matching. So each of these different nerves, we need to match to the correct objects on the model. Um, so that was obviously not the correct answer. That one, I dropped it right on the bone. Um, there, if I drop it on the nerve, I um, get the green flash and I'm ready to move on. Um, so after answering all of these correctly, you move on to the next question. Um, and this one is just, again, a multiple choice question that's um, built into some label matching as well. Uh, okay, so I think that's the big picture of how these sessions uh, work. So I'm going to go back to... Okay, go back to our presentation, and I'm going to um, show you next um, how these online resources specifically could be integrated into a course. And I'm going to talk about the lecture hall as an environment where we could use this, the laboratory, as well as I'm actually going to spend most of our time talking about how to use it for at-home studies, since this is the least familiar area for most faculty. Um, in the lecture hall, I found that um, utilizing this technology is great. It definitely um, captures the attention of your audience. Um, but the best times to use this are typically at the beginning and the end of a lesson. Um, at the beginning, it's very good for a topic that is completely foreign to a student, um, say a region like the pelvic floor that virtually no student has really spent that much time studying by the time they get to dental school or medical school. Um, so that's sort of nice to provide some visual context for what you're going to teach them, or to use it at the end for a topic that's very complex that you have to process in several layers. You can show it all integrated together at the end. That's helpful. Um, often I've found that this saves me time in lecture. Um, I, in some instances, I've been able to cut out five or ten minutes just by changing the medium that I'm using to present the material. Um, in the laboratory, I think this the, um, the application for this shouldn't be used to detract from the dissection experience, but if students do have access to technology like tablets or um, laptop computers in the cadaver lab, this would be a useful application to have on hand. Um, it could be used to substitute for some of the paper-based texts that you usually see in anatomy labs like the Netter Atlas or the Grants Atlas. These are very expensive textbooks um, that often have to be replaced annually because they get so soiled in the laboratory environment, um, and this would be an option that would be um, perhaps a bit more cost effective in the long term. Um, but you could also use this in a lab where you have um, large monitors that you can use to project images to direct students' attention towards particular aspects of the dissection work. Um, the last area that I'm going to spend time on in terms of integrating this um, technology is at home. I think this is the area that has the greatest potential for improving learning outcomes for students because I think this is where students have the most trouble and we're really most commonly not doing much um, to serve their needs in this area. And I'm going to present four levels of integration that kind of match my progression um, as I started using this technology in a very small way and gradually um, started adding more and more. Um, it into my into my classes, and this also mirrors what I've seen with a lot of my colleagues as they've started out with a toe in the water um, before they dove all the way in. 
So it's sort of the toe in the water, the minimal level of integration that you could use with something like this is to simply point them to the, this resource in the library. This is just a screenshot from our library website where you can see the link um, to this um, Gale Interactive product. Um, and this, this is great uh, primarily for the early adopters in your class who are always excited about new technologies. Uh, most, of, most of your rest of your students will probably ignore it, though, um, just because they don't want additional static. Um, if you want to maximize this, to demonstrate the resource in class and provide some sort of an explanation of how this might be useful for their at-home study. Um, students are often surprised when faculty um, give them suggestions on how to study because that's not um, not always common, depending on where the background of the student. Um, sort of the next level of integration um, would be to be more specific about how students might want to use these or which sessions might be useful. Um, this is a screen a screenshot of um, one of my lecture handouts um, where I have a recommended reading from a textbook, and you know I've been providing that recommended reading forever, and I'm pretty sure most of my students don't use it, um, but in addition to that, now I provide the interactive human anatomy sessions that I think would be most appropriate for the material in this lecture. Um, and I do think that the students are using these um, more specifically um, because it just matches their learning styles better than these sort of high-level anatomy textbook chapters that I um, have previously been recommending. Um, again, this is going to attract your early adopters because they're excited about the technology. It's going to attract the rule followers in your class um, because you suggested it, so then therefore they think they should do it. Um, if you want to maximize this, I would suggest explaining how this resource is different than the recommended pages in the textbook um, so that you're really driving students to that resource for the right reason. The next level of integration that I jumped into um, that actually took a little bit of courage was to make it important by making sure that I don't reteach that same material in a different way. Um, so I eliminated in-class instruction on topics that I felt that they could learn just as effectively from these online resources. Um, so I would create, this is a, uh, what you're seeing here is a, um, a screenshot of um, a self-study module that I've created for the students and I've assigned them to view these two sessions. Um, I've had created a few practice questions to make sure they got the lessons from those sessions. But then when they came to class, I didn't reteach that material again. Um, this, is, this makes it important and, and um, communicates to the students that it's an expectation more than just a recommendation. Um, what I've found is that some students do complain that I'm not making it easy for them to learn, or which I, I think what they mean is passive. Um, so uh, that's to be expected as students um, encounter these new expectations as they get to these higher levels of education. Um, if you want to maximize this, again, I would you know, have the same recommendations as I've had before in terms of demonstrating it or showing them why it's important. But really making the expectations clear that I'm not going to reteach this. You have to know this for the test. Um, and if you're really unsure about it, um, only do this for one section of your course um, for the first year and just see how it goes. Um, I think most of the time um, people are pleasantly surprised um, with the, uh, the impact of something like this. It just frees up time, allows the instructor to feel like they have a little bit more creative space classroom time. The last level that you can get to with this, with maximizing the at-home studies, you can completely rebuild your course. Um, and so I've done this in, in components of my course where I've just decided that I'm not going direct to do direct instruction on topics X, Y, and Z. And I'm going to spend our class time instead focusing on application and problem solving. Um, so this is really, you know, leaning into that flipped classroom pedagogy concept. Um, if you, can, if you can do this, everyone's going to use it, everyone's going to benefit. If the whole class can run this way, you get a lot less complaints um, than if you um, only do a section of your course this way. Um, what you can see here is a couple examples. This is just like a drawing exercise that I did in class after the students um, worked on the, um, the nerves of the pelvis as a module at home. Um, then I, when they got to class, we went through some of the more complex aspects of this particular reflex pathway um, by doing a drawing exercise together. So kind of making the classroom more engaged than just go, than getting through the content. 
Um, and this was a this is an image of a labeling contest that I did. I had the students um, try and label this image as fast as they could, and I, I think I ended up giving away pie or something to the um, the people who got it done the quickest. Um, so it just made the classroom a little bit more fun. Um, it, again, best practices for this, you know, same things that I've mentioned before, but um, the easiest things you can do with that application time are running practice questions, but the most high-yield things to do would be, you know, really focusing on integrative activities or business level activities. So I'm going to spend the last few minutes um, going through some data um, on an uh, experiment that I did where I used um, this technology to flip an anatomy laboratory. Um, the problem that I was trying to address with this study is a problem that almost any anatomist has um, in who does growth anatomy dissection. And that problem is that students come into the laboratory unprepared for their work. Um, this happens if you ask students to read a dissection manual before they come in as their preparation, because most dissection manuals are frankly written at a level that's too sophisticated for um, the, the novice learner who's just who's doing anatomy for the first time. Um, so what we end up doing is we spending, we're wasting a lot of instructional time on explaining the laboratory procedure. Um, and uh, personally, I think that, that I want to maximize my instructional time on the best possible um, activities that will help the students best. So our experiment was to provide some different types of pre-lab materials, um, one of which was the, was a, a, a similar type of technology to this. Um, it was video-based as opposed to fully interactive as the um, sessions that you've seen are. Um, but we, so we eliminated the in-class pre-labs altogether and rescheduled our class time to, for something more useful. So what this looks like, um, our traditional lab, um, we had um, class from 8.30 to 12.30. Um, we had a live pre-lab, which ate up a whole half hour at the beginning of the lab where we just sort of talked through the whole process. The students would do their dissection at the end of the period. They do some peer teaching and learning that would um, help make sure that everybody's on the same page about what they've learned. Um, so the students read from the dissection manual. Um, they, we don't have any data on how much time they spent on that task. It's probably pretty low because the students reported that it was very frustrating and low yield. Um, so in the flipped lab, um, you see that we eliminated the flat live pre-lab and students started right at 8.30. So what they were doing on their own was uh, working through whatever um, they chose from the various um, materials provided, either the videos um, or readings. Um, I'll go through those in a minute. Um, and they do a brief pre quiz to make sure they're ready. Um, and then they reported about half an hour, um, which was about the same amount of time we were spending previously. Um, and the students reported it was pretty easy and helpful. Um, at the end of the period, since we had an extra half hour at the end by shifting all of this down, what we did ended up using that time for was a more integrative group activity, um, such as like doing a simulated pen test, or um, we would have the students do a scavenger hunt for anatomical structures based on um, cryptic clues about um, a particular structure in the body. So it sort of gave the students an opportunity to use their knowledge immediately after their dissection work, uh, as opposed to waiting for a couple of weeks before they would get to it previously. Um, I asked the students to evaluate the four different resource types um, as to their importance for preparing for laboratory work. And the four resources were these 3D anatomy videos, um, actual videos of dissection, um, the instructions that I abbreviated down to 10 bullet points. So it's very minimized, very student-friendly language. And then um, a set of key atlas figures that would, uh, that related to the dissection. And as you can see, um, the highest rated, um, prep material was these 3D anatomy videos. Um, and the other one that scored very, very well was the atlas figures, um, which I think makes sense. These are excellent images that do serve a, a great purpose. Um, it was, somewhat surprising that there was such a big difference between the 3D anatomy videos and the dissection videos. Um, and I think what the students told me about this difference is that the dissection videos are harder to see exactly what's going on because the actual tissues are mostly shades of brown um, or shades of tan or pink. Um, and it's not as vivid as the anatomy that you see in these 3D anatomy videos. So it's a little bit harder to see what's actually going on. Um, so this was, um, this certainly shows that these resources align well with student preferences. 
Um, lastly, we looked at um, the usage of these materials and student performance. And what we found when we looked at the quartile grades, um, we took all the students um, over three years and broke them out into quartiles. And the top two um, quartiles tended to watch these videos much more um, than the bottom two quartiles. Certainly, this doesn't prove causation um, because it's entirely possible that these top half of the, of the class um, is using all resources more. Um, but it certainly suggests um, that the, um, you know, that there's a, a linkage between um, performance in the course and utilization of this particular resource. So uh, how this makes me feel as an educator, I think, is important. I think, you know, it's an important motivator if you're trying to work with faculty to um, suggest, you know, new products or innovations in a classroom. Um, the things that I feel like this has done for me is I feel like I can spend more time in class on advanced material, which is, just such a great uh, a great thing um, because I don't feel like I just have to get through the content. Uh, I can be more creative with that class time, and I can make sure that I can spend more time on the things that students commonly miss on the exam, um, and I don't have to just get through it. Um, I have more time to teach more things when my students are more efficient. Um, the picture that you see here is actually a great example of that. Um, I used uh, this sort of technology to teach a massage therapy class for medical students um, where the students were responsible for doing all of the anatomy work on their own um, before they come to class. And then when they came to class, we used all of our time for practice of massage therapy. Um, so we didn't have to reiterate the important points of the anatomy part of it. Um, we just were able to jump right in. Um, and lastly, I feel like this was this allows me to make a difference for my students where they really need it. Um, they seem like they are healthier and happier um, because they have the tools that they need to be more successful in their independent space. Uh, so I think that's about all I've got um, to contribute to the group. So um, I think with whatever time we have left, I think we'd all love to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Hoffman, uh, for giving us that live demonstration and sharing some of your insights. And um, we are now opening up to questions. And we have um, one right here for Dr. Hoffman. So how does this type of interactive learning tool compare to similar services offered that use videos to teach anatomy? Dr. Hoffman, can you share some perspective on that? Sure. Um, that's actually a really good question because, you know, the idea of using anatomy videos or animations for supplementing anatomy courses is not, you know, particularly new. Um, what is really different about this product is, um, on one hand, it is, it is actually, you know, an animation. So as I mentioned before, the you know, things that are act using actual videos of cadaveric materials can be somewhat hard to interpret the visual because it's not quite as vivid. Um, if you're comparing this to other anatomy simulation products, what this really does differently is it is fully, um, the, the student has full control of the simulation at all times. Um, most of the anatomy simulation products have limited axes of rotation. Um, they can often only be manipulated at certain points in a lesson. Um, this really is a more fluid environment where the student always has some degree of user control um, over the learning experience. Um, also, I would just say that the, the text that's provided in these, um, in these sessions and the questions that are in them are a bit more um, to the point um, and, and focused on shorter time intervals um, that I personally think are more in line with our student time expectations. Thank you, Dr. Hoffman. Um, we have another question here. This one goes out to Jerry. Uh, so when can we expect a mobile version of this tool to be available? Yeah, that's a very good point because as Dr. Hoffman had said, in the lab, this is a good technology to use uh, within the laboratory on a tablet, uh, he, although he did allude to a PC as well. But, uh, and we are certainly, it is not currently available uh, on tablets now, but will be very, very shortly. Uh, it will be available uh, no later than uh, 
first part of January. We're looking to pull that in, but no later than January. It will be iPad compatible as well as compatible on Android devices as well. It is currently uh, accessible uh, via Chromebooks. Great, thank you, Jerry. And I have uh, another question for you, Jerry. Um, is this product easy proxy friendly and or works well with other proxy servers for off-campus use? Yeah, although the technology is different, this doesn't work any differently than any of the Gale products. And so easy proxy is not a problem. The authentication comes through the library and uh, proxied over to a student, uh, an ID or a different device. And, and that will be seamless and transparent to any remote user in order to be able to use it. Great. Uh, this next question is for Dr. Hoffman. So could this be used in clinical settings for patient education? Absolutely. Uh, I think that would be a, a really good application for this. Um, and I think that a, a, a nice way to think about this is that this would be, if the students are utilizing this in their anatomy coursework in the first year, um, they may be exactly the right people um, to start bringing this into the clinical setting um, as they bring their own tablet into their clinical encounters with patients in their third and fourth years. Um, and I think that would be a really nice segue um, that would um, fill that particular need as well. And if, as Jerry mentioned, you know, the, I think the tablet interface would be really nice for that because um, I think a lot more clinicians are carrying tablets into their clinical encounters. Thank you, Dr. Hoffman. Uh, so this next question is for Jerry. So are most libraries subscribing or is it academic depart departments instead? Well, at this point, we don't have a lot of data to support one way or the other. We uh, just recently released this product in the beginning of the month, um, but it is uh, actually structured to be purchased by a library. Of course, that depends on each in individual institution as to where they may get uh, budget for that, but it is currently uh, a library product meant to uh, supplement uh, learning, homework help, and things of that nature for a student. Uh, as Dr. Hoppen had said, if, if faculty is not deeply uh, embedding this within their uh, curriculum uh, initially, and it's quite, quite not unexpected to think that they wouldn't completely change their uh, syllabus to do so, but it's a good start in the library used as a, a learning tool rather than a research tool. Uh, and this is quite different uh, than a lot of the things that, uh, that libraries stock. But I think it's something that libraries need to consider as some of the research is available outside of the library and this is another service that libraries can offer their students in order to help them uh, excel in, in the classwork that they're taking there. Thank you, Jerry. And we have another question for you, Jerry. Um, is there an option to create a playlist of sorts? Uh, from a playlist, uh, we, we do have it in terms of session-based, but we do not uh, actually allow um, any user at this point to create uh, a different order than what's there. You can embed a lot of this material uh, in other documents uh, and all of the, uh, those types of things are available as they are with all Gale products. But uh, at the current time, uh, the direct answer to that question would be uh, not at this time. Okay. And this next question is for Dr. Hoffman. So do you see this technology as something that could or should replace dissection? Um, I think that's that's a, a good question, and I think that depends on who you ask and where you're at. Um, certainly at the University of Iowa, and I think most American medical schools, um, we've you know we've had that discussion for many years now, and the the consensus within the United States seems to be really strongly in favor of dissection as an important part of the humanization or um, socialization to the humanities component of medicine. Um, it certainly engages you on an emotional and spiritual level. Um, unlike, you know, a, a, a virtual anatomy program. Um, so certainly here, we're really seeing it as a, as a supplement primarily. Um, but if you're in a, a part of the country or part of the world where um, dissection isn't realistic, um, this, this could really be um, a, a full substitution for some of the um, things that you traditionally do with a, a dissection. Um, furthermore, if you're 
working with, you know, a, a group of 400 undergraduate students, it's not reasonable to try and finagle that sort of group into a laboratory setting um, to do a cadaver dissection. Um, and it may not be appropriate for the type of course you're working with. Um, and we certainly have large undergraduate courses here that don't do dissection. Um, this gives them a more immersive tool to work with um, when they're taking their undergraduate anatomy courses. So I think it varies um, depending on your context, um, your student population. Great, thank you. Um, so this next question is for uh, Jerry. And the question is, can this be used on an oversized touchscreen device such as a touch table? Yeah, we're, when you talk to that, we're talking uh, sort of the uh, roadmap of the product. Um, this is not touch sensitive at this point. We are working with our product's uh, partner, CyberScience 3D, and there is some evolution to the product. In other words, as, uh, as I indicated in the product feature, this is non-stereoscopic 3D. In other words, you don't uh, like going into a movie theater and seeing a 3D film. Uh, however, uh, our partner uh, is taking steps to uh, provide this product in, in a uh, variation of its form, which then would uh, be able to be viewed in stereoscopic 3D, but that would require and is um, visible on uh, touch screens, interactive whiteboards, but you have to have the correct hardware in order to do that. Uh, so this particular product, no, but evolution uh, of what we'll be offering should uh, faculty want to use it more in-depth in the classroom and take advantage of its stereoscopic capability, yes. Uh, there is an interim, uh, an interim step here that we're investigating now which will allow uh, a user to just don a pair of 3D glasses and be able to click a button on the product, which is not available now, of course, and be able to actually see 3D through their, their, their computer, much like all you need is a copy of a, a pair of glasses when you go and see a 3D film. So uh, to summarize, again, number one, no, it's not currently capable with touch screens, although you can uh, buy hardware and software and, and work with our partner uh, to get that experience. And in the evolution of the product, we may uh, certainly go in that direction. Okay, great. Um, and then this next question is for Dr. Hoffman. So can you make the cadaver move or simulate disease states to show what that looks like? It, not at this time. I think that is a, a another natural evolution for the product. Um, that Cyber Science 3D has been working on um, making the model move, um, and certainly it's very easy to do from a skeletal perspective. Um, but we're also trying to do that in a way that um, that would allow you to see how muscle forms change around joints. Um, as, even in a simple joint. There's a lot of um, 3D modeling to make sure that the, the way the muscles change um, happens accurately and that it looks, um, looks the way it would actually look and that the way the structures move during movement is accurate. Um, so that work is underway, um, and I think it's been really successful. Um, we started from the, from the head and we're working our way down, and it looks pretty good from the neck up. Um, so we're starting to work our way down into the more complicated aspects of limb movement um, as we go. Thank you, Dr. Hoffman. Our next question is for Jerry. So the, the question is, is this product being used by undergraduate or master's degree granting institutions? Would the level be appropriate for undergraduate introductory anatomy and physiology, nursing, and athletic training students? Yeah, I think uh, from that aspect, it was uh, originally intended, based on the research that we've done, uh, is to be a critical learning tool in first and second year anatomy and anatomy and physiology. Uh, some of the problems that uh, that occurred in, in terms of some of the people that we talked to when we created the product were that a lot of students coming into colleges on programs such as this uh, really need a refresher uh, in that case. And so it, it acts as a refresher for, say, 
uh, higher level students who always want to go back and utilize it, uh, but its intention is to start out with basic anatomy uh, in, in that level uh, of student. Uh, of course, uh, what, what we didn't say is this, is this is available to everyone at an institution should your library decide to subscribe to it. It's not limited um, by individual license, so anyone can come back, let's say an advanced student that takes a more advanced class, wants to go back and do a refresher on some things that they, they just weren't clear on, they can always go back to the library and, and uh, refresh themselves. So um, the, the intent is undergraduates, but I don't know, if, uh, Dr. Hoffman, if you would have a different opinion on that. Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I think you get a different answer depending on the anatomist that you ask. You know, what, what is the appropriate level for an undergraduate nursing course versus a medical versus an athletic training versus a physical therapy course? Um, you know, what, what I think I tried to bring to this was having experience in teaching all of those different levels of students. I really tried to make this, um, this, these sessions applicable to a student who's at any of those levels. Uh, I certainly think there's, there's details that the, the, the average undergraduate nursing anatomy student um, would, would recognize as more detail than they actually need. Um, but then there's probably also some sessions that are, that are driven more towards a basic anatomy um, learning goal. So I think there's something there for students at all levels, and I think it, it might be helpful um, for the anatomy faculty involved to help curate the right sessions for the right learners um, at the level that's needed at that particular institution. I can say that at the, with the, all the different anatomy courses that I teach into here, both undergraduate um, as well as graduate level and professional courses, I think there, that all of them could utilize this in some way or another in their courses. Okay, great. Um, and our last question that we have is, is there a trial version available for faculty? And I'll go ahead and answer that question. So on the screen here, we have the website gale.com slash interactive academic. And that website will give you information about uh, the product, Gale Interactive. And then there is a form that you can fill out to request a trial of the product. So. That's uh, gale.com slash interactive academic, and you can request a trial there or uh, request to get in touch with a Gale representative to learn a little bit more about the product. And I, I believe that that's all the questions that we have, and I'm going to hand it over to Mark now. Great. Thank you, Laura. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Hoffman and, and Jerry, for taking some time today um, to walk us through this product and to um, talk about how it might be used. Um, I'd like to take a moment to give you both, all three of you really, uh, a virtual round of applause. Um, we greatly appreciate the time that you've spent with us and, and your insights. As a reminder for other folks on the line, we have recorded today's program, so be on the lookout for a follow-up email from ACRL in Choice that will include instructions on how to access the archived version. Thanks again to everyone for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the session, and I hope you have an excellent day.